Child support, it's the gift that keeps on taking. So how do you and your lawyer best position yourself so that you only pay what's fair? This is the American Law Journal, made possible in part by Cozen O'Connor, a full-service client-oriented law firm among the 100 largest in the United States, Einhorn, Harris, Asher, Barbarito, Frost, and Ironson, one of the largest family law practices in the state of New Jersey, King, Spry, Herman, Freund, and Fall a comprehensive practice serving its clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law matters for over 30 years. And The Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal publication and daily newspaper for lawyers. You and your spouse split. How do you calculate support for your kids? Well, you take your ex's income and you take yours, you put them together, and then you apportion the responsibility, right? Well, it's not that simple. Good evening. This is the American Law Journal tonight. Child support. How do courts calculate it? What happens if there is a modification order? And what happens if you don't pay that support? Three noted and experienced family law practitioners with me on the program tonight, as well as a representative from the state of New Jersey. Bonnie Frost is a partner with the preeminent New Jersey family law practice of Einhorn Harris in Denville. She is a past chair of the New Jersey State Bar Association's family Family Law Section. David Ladove is the immediate past chair of Pennsylvania's Family Law Section. He's also a partner with the <coughs> top 100 U.S. law firm Cozen O'Connor. Don Spry is what I like to call the Dean of Family Law Practice in the Greater Lehigh Valley. Don has been practicing for over 30 years and he joined us on one of our very first television programs. Don, 17 years ago, and I've got the tapes to prove it. <laughs> One of these days, Don, we may actually pull them out. And Alicia Griffin joins us for the very first time this evening. She is the director of the Office of Child Support and Paternity Programs for the state of New Jersey. Quick reminder, we're not taking your telephone calls tonight, but if you need more information, it's easy. Go to our website, AmericanLawJournalTV.com. Every program that we produce here on the show later goes up to our website as a webcast. If you need the name of an attorney in about three dozen different areas, Areas of the law. I simply want to see what's coming up next. Call us toll free 888 78 Law TV. Write to us at info at lawjournaltv.com. Go to the website, get your law on demand. Well, all these years tackling family law topics and discussing things such as uh, divorce and separation and custody, all those emotional elements, David LaDove, now we finally get the accountants to sit down with the lawyers, and now it's number crunching, no more emotion. Wrong. <laughs> uh, the emotion runs even higher, um, I have found, because it, it really is the nuts and bolts. How is a dependent spouse going to put food and, and clothing on her kid's back and on her table? And I don't wish to be sexist, I did say her, but you know I, I'm sure the statistics, uh, Alicia will tell us, the majority of the people seeking child support are female. Um, not male. And Bonnie, it's no longer just about the kids now, like relocation or custody issues. Now it's kids plus money. So it's got to be incendiary. Well, it always is incendiary, but it's the problem that I think we have with a lot of the um, the mothers who, who are receiving child support is it's not enough. How am I supposed to pay for spikes? How am I supposed to pay for food? Unfortunately, that's all in the child support calculation. And Don, when you have someone come into your office, and let's say again, it is a it is a female client, uh, the mom who is you know going to have to go up against the dad, and she is probably going to be the custodial parent, even though they're going to share joint legal custody. Doesn't she say, well, I'm going to be the one who has to pick up all the extras. I've got to pick up, you know, the five and dime stuff, the haircuts, this, that, or the other thing. Don't they think coming right out of the chute that they're going to be shortchanged? I think so. Um, I think in most of these cases, and I think Bonnie and uh, Dave can bear it out, um, you know, the payor, the person that's making the payments, thinks they're paying too much, and the person that's receiving is not getting enough. And the problem is those uh, two wage earners or one wage earner, as the case may be, supported one household. Now that same amount of money has to support two, so it's going to be a, probably a, a lower of standard of living for everybody. 
Alicia, is there any way for the state to come up with statistics or any kind of study that would back up what Don and Dave and Bonnie have said that, you know, as a practical matter, the custodial parent, usually the mom, does get the short end of the stick? Well, it's certainly, um, she's the one left with the kids for the most part and is in fact um, dealing with the remnants of the relationship and trying to figure out how to cover all of the expenses that the two uh, incomes were going to be covering in the past. About 80% um, of all of our um, cases are in fact custodial parents where it's the mom picking up the burden. There's about 18 to 20% now that are also single dads who are facing that same issue. But again, Dave, in your experience, the custodial parent is the one that no matter how you try to cut the deal, and you know this going in, when you, start, when, when you do get the deal cut, if you will, you go before the, the court, the judges have heard it a million times, but she is the custodial parent. Shouldn't we apportion something a little bit more for that custodial parent? But that's really not how the guidelines well, work. Yeah, and that's when you use the word guideline, that's the key, is that all of our states, and Alicia can give you the date when we all had to adopt it because we all had to follow the federal government's lead. Um, all the states have formulas or guidelines that are these arithmetic calculations. And while each state has what, what you'll call deviation or some kind of discretion, very rarely do uh, the judges move off of the guideline. And that becomes the number. And unfortunately, and I, I could you know, clap Bonnie, she hit the nail right on the head. The guidelines don't take into account those fashion designer labels for clothing or sneakers or spikes or soccer balls, et cetera, et cetera. And there's just not enough. Not enough under the miscellaneous tab, Bonnie. Uh, it, it really doesn't appear to be. And, and one of the problems that I find with the guidelines is that when you have some type of shared parenting, because the guidelines, the amount of support that a, a father would pay if he has more overnights with the children goes down. And sometimes the more, the closer that the parents get to 50-50 and the father still has to pay money in child support to the, the, to the mother, then we have people who's buying the clothes. Right. You know, who's buying the sneakers? Who's buying the winter coats? Well, I'm paying you child support. You should, but you're getting the reduction in about a 50% of what you should have been paying. And all this is and it's very, very difficult. Don, there, I think there are, what is, aren't there mandatory reviews of, of support, what, every four years? Or is it the kind of thing that it comes up sooner anyway because the parents have a disagreement sooner? And, uh, and is that an airtight rule for years? I think the federal uh, law requires the, the states to um, revamp the guidelines or review the guidelines every four years, but typically you might find modifications for reasons such as a change of jobs, change in income because uh, someone get, becomes disabled, mm -hmm. all, all sorts of reasons. Uh, in Pennsylvania, they, they, the uh, support orders can be modified based upon substantial change in circumstances. Substantial change in circumstances. So Don, if you have a client, let's say you have a mom and the kid or kids are, let's say, six years old or younger, how many times are we going to see a request for modifying that support order be before they reach the age of majority, on the average? Well, you could, I would say, um, maybe every three to four years you could, you could see that. Okay. It's really hard to say. Is it always acrimonious? Well, in New Jersey, just to follow up on Don saying, we're, we're supposed to have a three-year review. And okay. they send out their, our child support enforcement sends out letters and saying your three-year review time is up. Send us in your financial information. And don't information. you want to say, shh, don't, don't, <laughs> rust, don't rustle the nest. It depends on who you're representing, of really. <laughs> but Alicia, it is every three years that you folks want to know what's going on with every support order in the state, correct? Um, well, every support order that comes through the public system, certainly. Um, we have actually three ways of modifying an order in New Jersey. You have the uh, opportunity for an individual or a set of individuals to come before the court and motion the court for that change in circumstances or the every three years we will in fact um, modify that order. We'll send out a notice asking people if they're interested in having their, their order reviewed. And the last thing is that after 1998 um, we actually started to allow something called a cost of living adjustment. Mm -hmm. So you can get an automated cost of living okay. adjustment which is based on the um, regional index, um, which is a, a very 
small cost of living increase, but theoretically it's supposed to get at a little bit of an increase every so, two years. Not that big a deal, Dave, apparently. I mean, it, I, it, it, I, Pennsylvania I, doesn't have it. We though. don't have it, and I just heard what Alicia said. I said, can you come over and try to work that for <laughs> us? Because any increase is going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, when you say how many times do people come back, um, I find it, 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 it regulates based upon how, when the kids get older. That when the kid starts middle school and the clothing wardrobe really drastically changes, mom is sitting there saying, I can't afford this anymore. Or the kid becomes a driver, a licensed driver, and has car insurance. Or, you know, these kinds of events trigger modifications. Now, it's not as simple. I mentioned, I was rather tongue in cheek at the top of the show, that, you know, you take the incomes, you put them together, you apportion the responsibility, and we're good to go. It's not that way. What are the various factors that go into calculating what someone makes as an income, especially a wealthy individual with a nice 401k or at least benefits and stock options and that sort of thing. Now the accountants get into it and all of a sudden those legal bills start running up. Do they not, Bonnie? Well, the, um, in our guidelines, we talk about perks have to be added back in, um, such as if you get free gas because you work for Exxon. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a perk that would be added into your income. If you mm -hmm. get a free car, that was a perk. So all of a sudden, the $100,000 a year person is now $110,000, uh, for child support purposes, mm -hmm. 401k contributions are not deducted. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so those types of perks will be added back in. One of the more difficult issues in New Jersey has always been stock options. You know, because you'll get taxed on them maybe, but you can't exercise them for a period of time. And is that really income for child support purposes? And so that's sort of like the intellectual part, but we should be so lucky to have people who have the stock options <laughs> to worry about, I guess. But uh, Don, what about uh, what about clients who come to you and, uh, you know, it's a mom and, you know, she's saying, look, I'm out there working and I'm doing the best I can. But by the way, my dad is also helping me out a little bit here. You know, he's given, you know, he's worried about the kids. He gives them 100 or 200 a week and gives us some money for food. In some states, I don't know about Pennsylvania, I think there was a pretty significant case out of North Carolina that says, you know what, the courts can go ahead and factor that in as income. What about PA? What about New Jersey? Does that ever become an issue? Uh, I think the uh, Williams case in North Carolina talked yes. about that. And yeah. My experience in Pennsylvania is when I have tried to argue, I've tried to argue on behalf um, of the um, payor spouse, the person who's making the payments, that if the dependent spouse is receiving money from their family, that they for, therefore have more disposable income, and that should be considered. And I, I, I haven't won that argument. Uh, I don't think you're going to, Don. I think the I only take it you haven't either, Dave. No. <laughs> I think the only time you could win that argument is if there was some type of steady payment. Right. The mother was living in the house, and so the mm -hmm. mother's paying rent. Or, mm -hmm. But, you know, just a gratuitous gift, uh, I just, I mean, the parents, grandparents right. don't have a duty to support the child. All right, let's take a look at that elusive, substantial change in circumstances, which is the basis of modifying a support order and can, comes up every few years or even sooner, what's the soonest you've seen your client or your adversary uh, say, ah, change in circumstances, substantial, three months, six months after the, the initial order? I, I've seen quick ones. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, we're right now in a pretty tumultuous economic time, and people get laid off, mm -hmm. so there's no time period. You know, you, someone gets laid off or uh, someone has a drop uh, in income, you can well, come you, in real quickly. So you see the legitimate ones, Dave, but yeah. you also see the people who are still ticked off with the original order, well, and they're going to take their, uh, next, uh, their next shot maybe a few months down the line. Do you see that as well, Bonnie? Well, you can see that sometimes. I think the problem, in, not the problem, but in New Jersey, courts would look at that type of very quick change as a temporary change of circumstances, and, and that person right. would not get relief. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes, you know, I have seen a couple of men who think that they're Marines in foxholes, <laughs> and they take their position, and they're not getting out. <laughs> and, you know, they're not paying, and they're not getting out of the foxhole. I, I had one um, case where the man lived in his car. He was an executive in a big oh. company for two years. It was a stunning thing. It was a Toyota Corolla. It wasn't that big either. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that you have some people like that, but they're few and far between. 
you mentioned, Dave, uh, change in, change in uh, circumstances being someone loses a job. But, uh, Don, let me throw this to you because I think there was a fairly significant, uh, well, it's a Pennsylvania, New Jersey case that we're covered on both ends here on, uh, on, on the set here tonight, where someone goes out and gets another job, but they are voluntarily underemployed. In other words, they're out making $100,000. And you know now you know they get fired or they leave their job and they figure hey you know what you know the ex is, is helping here he's going to pay a larger share of taking care of the kids I'm going to work at a fifty thousand dollar year job instead of kill, killing myself and working eighty hours a week at a big law firm in New Jersey I'm going to become a paralegal and just work half the time but what happens then? Well, I think the general rule is is that uh, your income is uh, your income capacity and not your actual income. Meaning that if you have a capacity to earn $100,000 a year, and then you take a job at $50,000 a year, the argument is that uh, you should be assessed support at $100,000 a year. Now, this Gregoric case in Pennsylvania, um, actually, my office handled that case and. I sort of thought that that turned it on its head because it, it came out differently than I would have expected. There, there was a circumstance where the, um, the mom was the executive director of the Boy Scouts at around 100000 and then she took a job as a teacher at 50000 And the court said that, well, that was a mitigation of uh, circumstances and we're going to permit it and we're going to uh, permit her to pay on 50000 it was and that, different, that, different than I've typically seen those cases. I mean, the arguments you typically make, I, I would have thought it went, would have gone the other way, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. Not you just see. because we argued it. <laughs> <laughs> you argued it successfully. <laughs> So, and, and again, so the Superior Court in Pennsylvania, uh, I guess, uh, that, yeah, the, the PA yeah, Super 2006. So now that, that ostensibly becomes the law or the interpretation of the law in the state. Or, Dave, you think that it's kind of thing? It's all fact sensitive. I mean, that's my experience is that, right. you know, a trial judge is going to hear a set of facts that he or she is either going to buy or just say, you know, I don't really think you made a 100% effort, or I think you did. And depending upon how that comes across to that judge is going to make the call on that. I, I, I don't think that that case is going to, yeah, it gives us an indication that here's the important factors, but it's so darn discretionary. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about schooling, because I think years ago, I think, again, this is what's so nice when you deal with uh, people, Old in people. Practice, <laughs> people in the practice so long is that I'll get corrected just like this. But I think in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, at one time it was considered, college for the kids was one time considered to be, if not an obligation, pretty much close to that. But I don't think either state, now, New Jersey oh, still yes, does. Do. Okay, Pennsylvania yep. used to, right, Don, you, you folks used to, uh, used to be part of a, a duty or responsibility on the part of both parents if the kid wanted to go to college. The parents had to kick in for college, correct? Yes, that's no, less, that's no longer the rule, though. Right. Was that change legislated? Is that a statutory change or was that case law? It was blue versus blue, case out of Lehigh County. Okay. Yeah. He passes the bar exam, as he always okay. says. Yeah. But in New Jersey, Bonnie, that it's still an obligation. Yes, it is. But okay. it's, there are 13 or 14 factors that our court has to look at. But by and large, um, the, theory, the, the theory behind it all is that we are not going to let children become mm -hmm. victims of divorce. Right. And so while uh, we recently had a case about two years ago at the Supreme Court, Gack versus Gack, and he argued, the father argued that he was it was a constitutional issue. He shouldn't be forced to pay for college, and our Supreme Court said, oh, yes, you can. Because our statute has so many factors and the, and the courts have discretion to say, well, maybe you don't have to, Chris, but, David, you do, because your facts are different than his facts. Gotcha. Um, so we still do have that, and I think part of it is because we have a very educated population. What about uh, the associated living expenses that goes, goes with, uh, with college education, especially let's say the parties agree that, okay, we're going to pay for the kids' college. Let's say they're in Pennsylvania. We're gonna, we agree to pay for the kids' college, and we're going to pay associated living expenses uh, while the kid's away at school. Can one of the spouses say, well, during the summer months and holidays, he's not going to school, so we're not paying the associated living expenses? Or do you think, how would you interpret, the, uh, interpret that, Dave? In Pennsylvania, it's all contractual. Right. If you don't put it down, you're not getting it. Um, and, you know, I, I turned to Bonnie and, and Alicia in terms of New Jersey. You know, people always ask me, uh, because the states are contiguous and they have so many opportunities to live in one state or the other, right. and people with teenage kids, I say, jump to Jersey. Uh, I absolutely tell people, go live in Jersey because of the college support. It's a real 
sad day. It was a sad day when, in my opinion, we knocked that out because uh, it really created a problem. But the associated expenses, right now, um, it's purely contractual, whatever you agree to, and that's it. It will not be interpreted. Mm -hmm. Alicia, in the state of New Jersey, uh, I understand also that there may be a time that uh, parents have to kick in when it comes to tuition to a private school. Well, I think that that's just like Dave was saying. In most cases, it's a fact-sensitive scenario that if, in fact, the parents um, have an issue in which they want to send the child to a parochial school or a specific arts or a language school of some sort or another, that, again, needs to be written in and can be considered as part of the order um, that they establish. Don Spry, let's take a look at the notion of remarrying. I think at one time in the state of Pennsylvania, it was perhaps a bigger issue, a, a, a more important issue, if you will, when it came to calculating support. With some of these strict state guidelines that we have and, and with full faith and credit and uniformity across the country, when someone remarries, how does that differ today than, say, 15 or 20 years ago? What factor does it play, if any? I don't really think it plays a factor in support for the reason that the, pers uh, the new spouse does not have an obligation to support the child. Uh, it's still an obligation of both parents, so I think I would get about as far with that as my other <laughs> argument. <laughs> well, New Jersey, it's specifically written into the guidelines mm -hmm. that the, next, the, the other new spouse has no duty or obligation. You don't have to reveal the income unless you want to have your new child with the new spouse Right. considered in the whole calculation because now we have oh, it's three voluntary kids. I'm sure there are people running to the door to get <laughs> to jump on that bandwagon yeah. but, so but, but let's say a mom okay divorces uh, uh, her, her husband and she's making fifty thousand dollars and five years later she ends up marrying a multi-millionaire now she really doesn't have to work maybe she takes uh, part-time work at twenty five thousand or she takes you know she takes a job for twenty five thousand now is the court going to sit back and say well uh, you know Mr. Mr. So-and-so, you've got to pay that much more because your ex is making half of what she made, even though she's living with a, with a millionaire who's got lots of assets. Now, it goes to the same argument that Don was talking about. If she had the ability to earn the 50, they would still impute the 50. Yeah. They're not okay. going to impute her husband's income to her, however. Okay. All right. It may be a factor when they go to college, though, yeah. because they say that it is a factor to consider when we allocate college costs because if you have the millionaire new husband, and we should all be so lucky. <laughs> I told my husband in my next life he's going to be rich. Uh, that, that, that's a factor because you, as the custodial parent, are relieved of some of your other financial obligations, so you have more disposable income to contribute to college. I, I haven't, we make that argument, but it's very difficult, and there's really no precision that we could ever say how a judge is going to decide what how that factors into the entire equation, but that's what the law is. You know, uh, we've done uh, programs in the past on deadbeat dads. I don't know if that uh, term is still in vogue anymore or perhaps it, it's gone the way of discotheques, but the phenomena <laughs> is still very much, uh, a very, a very much a real fact. Uh, Alicia, I know that in some states across the country, if you don't pay up what you should be paying, they'll revoke your license, they'll uh, deny you a passport, if you win a lottery, you're not going to get everything. Uh, they might even withhold your pay. What does New Jersey do to deadbeat mom or dads or people who are significantly behind on their child support? We do all of those things, as does Pennsylvania and many of the surrounding states, because it's all federally mandated. We're required when um, each state is required to exercise um, state uh, venue, state law, in terms of deciding what the threshold is when you'll exercise some of those things, with the exception of things like uh, passport revocation um, or tax intercept, federal tax, um, all states have to use the federal criteria for both of those programs. Um, and both of them have been very successful. I mean, again, we try and stage different remedies based on what makes the most amount of sense for the kids and the family. You don't want to take somebody's license if they're going to need that to work. That's usually a last resort, a last remedy, um, in that you want to really try and, and get them to work, get them to pay. The incentive is to try and get them uh, to back into compliance, to meeting that obligation and, and really doing um, and supporting the family and supporting the kids. What is the most uh, daunting task about coming up with the right child support? Because again, Dave, it isn't just about numbers crunching. It's not just about the numbers. You know, you're asking me this, and, and I hate to tell war stories, but I'm on the eve of trial because tomorrow morning I am trying a support case 
and <clears throat> because of the party's income, it's in Pennsylvania called a Melzer case, but it basically is a needs analysis. And I worked with my client this morning for a number of hours trying to develop what it cost her for her children in terms of summer activities, ballet, orthodonture, um, clothing, food, uh, you know, the essentials, but also all those extras mm -hmm. because you don't want to forget anything. Mm -hmm. And when it came to um, her kids having birthday parties and one of her children is now reaching an age where they're going to be invited to higher and fancier parties um, and the gifts that they have to give. And, and, and when you ask me the question, how, you know, what's the hardest thing? To me, trying to figure out what in the world the real needs are and the reasonable needs of those kids, because you know, all of us can go take vacations around, you know, to the Caribbean, or we can go uh, to the Poconos. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of difference in costs, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you go figure out what's reasonable, and that's the hard part that I have really uh, been tackling. And and it's just funny you mention it tonight because uh, I'm right on top of it right Good. now. Good. Hopefully, maybe we've just sharpened you up just that much uh, more. Well, my client <laughs> might appreciate it <laughs> for tomorrow's. Uh, action in court. Bonnie, what about you? Well, I was just thinking when uh, Dave was talking, is, is probably the other part of that, what makes it difficult for us as lawyers, is at least in New Jersey, judges are paid $141,000 a year. So if you have the high income earner who makes a hundred, you know, a million or 1.5, and you're talking about needs for those children, it's very difficult for them to understand. And there's one case that says, well, you know, how many more ponies does this child need except one? But he's used to six. Exactly. And, and it's very difficult and you've for got to people sell who've that never case. had that experience, mm -hmm. had that earning, had that lifestyle at all to understand that, that and, need. And let me just follow up, and, and I'm going to go back to this analogy. If the judge is used to the Holiday Inn, how can you go in front of the judge and say, but we only stay at the Four Seasons? or, you know, of that he caliber. He won't even understand what the Four Seasons means. <laughs> and, and that's it's the, the other problem. problem. Don Spry, your most, the most daunting element in uh, child support matters. Well, I, I think um, uh, income flow. Uh, Bonnie and um, Dave, in, we're talking, Dave's talking about a situation in Pennsylvania where the combined net incomes of the people are $20,000 or more per month. Uh, in, in cases that are under guidelines, the, the real concern is trying to make sure that you capture all the um, cash flow. Um, and if the more cash flow you capture, the higher the uh, support order is representing the payor, you want to make sure that phantom income is not being included and things that are going to drive the order up uh, improperly. So that I, that's the hardest task uh, I find, is making sure that the uh, cash flow is accurate. Alicia Griffin, uh, where should people, at least in the state of New Jersey, go if they need to get some help? Um, well, certainly they can go to our website, which is www.njchildsupport.org. We also have a phone number, 1-877-NJ-KIDS-1, and um, both of those have uh, customer service components to them, so if people have individual questions or need individual help, they can get it, as well as the general help. And the guidelines are also posted on the judiciary website, so people can look at that and talk and investigate more about the guidelines. I want to thank my guests again for uh, dispensing uh, two, three, four years worth of legal information in 30 minutes. Bonnie Frost from Einhorn Harris in New Jersey, Dave LaDove, Cozen O'Connor in Pennsylvania and actually all around the country. Don Spry with King Spry, Herman Freund and Fall in the Greater Lehigh Valley and Alicia Griffin, the Director of Office of Child Support and Paternity Programs. Folks, I want to remind you, here's what's coming up over the next three weeks on our program. And if you need more information, it's real simple. Go to our website, AmericanLawJournalTV.com. Call us toll free, 888-78-LAW-TV. Write to us at info at LawJournalTV.com. Get your law on demand for all of us here at the American Law Journal. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next Monday night right here on the American Law Journal. Good night now. Tonight's Law Journal has been made possible in part by Cozen O'Connor, a full-service client-oriented law firm among the 100 largest in the United States, serving both business and private clients, headquartered in Philadelphia with over 20 offices throughout the U.S. and in London. 
Einhorn, Harris, Asher, Barbarito, Frost, and Ironson. For over 40 years, building its reputation serving individuals, commercial and private business clients in personal injury, zoning, estate planning, criminal law, and one of the largest family law practices in the state of New Jersey, with offices in Denville. King, Spry, Herman, Freund, and Fall, a comprehensive practice serving its clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law matters for over 30 years, with four offices in Allentown, Bethlehem, Bangor, and Stroudsburg. And The Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal publication and daily newspaper for lawyers.